So what do we mean about getting intentional? As I was looking at it, the, the first law of intentionality is growth doesn't just happen. That there are ways in which we can be intentional, whether we're farming or whether we're growing young people and growing a stronger community. But my son, who's an organic farmer, would be disturbed if I didn't comment on this slide, which makes it look like being intentional is rows and rows of the same thing. And that's not the case. It does not have to lead to conformity and homogeneity. Getting intentional about social emotional learning is not about making everybody have the same ways of being, but rather helping people find their effective ways of being and their effective skills. Now, what are we getting intentional about? We're getting intentional about the ways we, whether in schools or families or out of school community, the way we support young people developing their own ways of being, their ways of dealing with feelings, their ways of dealing with relationships, their ways of doing or dealing with tasks. These ways of being are, include knowledge of, about yourself, knowledge about others. They include particular kinds of skills you can help young people use. They involve attitudes or beliefs that young people have. But fundamentally, all of those ways of being come back to ways of dealing with feelings, ways of dealing with relationships, and ways of dealing with doing or tasks. The model that Kate, I, and Brandy uh, developed uh, is called the Ways of Being model. I'm not going to talk extensively about it, but it was created because we were trying to find a language that wasn't so full of jargon that you started fighting about which term you meant, and that was more about opening up the thinking about it than narrowing down the how to do it. And both of those are necessary. So in addition to these three dimensions I've mentioned, it's also important to recognize there are layers of ways of being if you want to think of it that way. So those are, there are some of the ways of being that become who we are. They get built into our identity. So I am a thinker by nature. <laughs> Staff who know me are all nodding their heads, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there are also ways of being that we have that are about our awareness how we're aware of others, how we're aware of our feelings. My staff would also say, one of the things I'm not particularly good at is reading minds. So if you're sitting in a meeting with me and you're really upset about something, I'm not going to see that you're upset unless you say something about it because I'm not attuned. My awareness of your reactions is probably lower. Anyway. But then you also have skills that you use and bring to the ways you navigate those situations the ways you think about it. And for me, one of the ways of doing it was to tell my staff, if you're unhappy, don't just frown, say something. So developing our ways of being is uh, important and helping young people do this is what we're trying to get intentional about. Intentional to the right degree, in the right way, in a supportive and improvement-oriented way, not in a judgment-oriented way. There's a great blog that was posted on the center blog site around measuring and should we measure in the marshmallow test and the variety. I encourage you to look at it. It's got some thoughtful things by Sam, uh, Samantha Grant. As we get intentional about development, we need to go back and remember what development is fundamentally about. And early in my journey as on trying to understand youth and youth development, it became quite clear to me that there are three fundamental building blocks of development. Constructive places, the environments in which young people are, Caring people, what all of us in the youth work would call relationships, 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 and the challenging possibilities young people have in those things. Challenging, not meaning bad, but challenging meaning provoking growth, giving people a chance to expand what they know and what they do. And these building blocks are very important, but it's the accumulation of everyday experiences where you see learn, try, and practice their ways of being that matter. And they have those experiences in those places with those people and those possibilities. The other thing I learned early in, in a phrase that I use a lot now is that social-emotional competencies are both taught and caught. 
That is to say, as much as you may want to teach something to somebody, you also need to recognize that they're catching it from you and catching it from their environments. That is, it is caught. And unlike math and reading, social emotional competencies are probably more caught than taught. That is, the way we act, the way we interact, is probably as important or more important than what we say at times. Getting intentional, however, in social emotional learning, as in math and science and other reading, involves using both approaches. We cannot sit on our laurels and saying, we run a quality program and kids will catch good stuff. We have to do that, but we also have to get intentional about the ways we try to shape those environments. And we'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So what's the promise of social emotional learning? And when I talk about the promise, I'm not talking about the promises social learning makes. You know, I'm not talking about social emotional learning since promising to close the achievement gap. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is the promise social emotional learning holds. And that promise comes, that great promise comes from fundamentally two things. It comes from the growing evidence about an interest in and the value placed on all young people's being socially, emotionally competent. And, it, and the importance of those factors in helping them be successful in school, careers, and life. This growing wave that I'm going to talk about, or waves. The second great promise of social emotional learning is very much specific to out of school time and extended learning opportunities. And that is the ways expanded learning opportunities in out of school time can contribute and build these competencies. These are at the heart of what we have always been talking about. They overlap with good youth work, good youth development. They overlap with good quality work in our programs. So this is not something that's new, but it is something that can be done better in our field. I want to use the analogy of waves because I've learned in my career over time that, that waves come and you ride them to get move the field forward and the waves don't disappear. There's always other waves and there's even that wave comes back. But if you're going to use a wave to move the field and improve what we're doing for children and youth, then we've got to understand those waves and how do we build those waves and how we ride those waves. And I say waves, not wave. I'm not talking about social emotional learning as a wave that comes and goes, a fad, that kind of wave. I'm talking about the wave that brings energy and allows you to move forward and you get to use it to do things that you want to do. Youth development was a wave 20 years ago. Quality has been a wave that we have. Both of those waves are still hitting upon our shores and they still have value. But now we have new waves around social emotional learning and more people are looking at those waves and using those waves and so we've got to figure out how to ride them. The growing wave of social emotional learning um, comes from the growing evidence, uh, from the kind of awareness, the value, and increasing calls for actions from multiple sectors. It's now, according to the Wallace Foundation study by Ed Research, uh, it's now high on the agenda in policy language, in uh, school language, and in after school. Uh, this is a chart of, uh, uh, created by that same research of the amount of studies and, and articles and things published around social emotional learning over the last 40 years. If that doesn't look like a wave, I don't know what does. But getting intentional about the waves not only means how to read them and understand them and think, but it also involves how do you position yourself on the wave? How do you learn to arrive and getting intentional about riding the waves? Now, as many of you may have guessed, that's not me. I will say at this point that uh, I can tell you how I think about getting intentional. All of you are the experts about getting intentional and working it. So I warn you that if you were to take lessons from me on how to ride waves, you ought to know two things about me. One, the first time I stepped on a skateboard in my freshman year of high school, I spent a month and a half with a broken tailbone. The first step on a skateboard. Second thing you ought to know about me is that when I tried skiing with my little brother in the Big Brothers Big Sisters program, I broke a rib before I got to the bunny hill. <laughs>
So my ability to ride and balance is not necessarily strong, particularly in the practice world. But I do think I can offer some insights into how to think about getting intentional. We can think about youth development, our quality improvement efforts, and getting intentional on social emotional learning as three different areas. And there's overlap in these areas. What I want to argue is that the promise of social emotional learning and getting intentional about it will start to be realized when we start growing these things together and connecting them more fully and putting at the center of them the kind of social emotional competencies, these ways of being that I was talking about earlier. It's not the only thing you do in youth programs. It's not the only thing schools do. It's not the only things quality is about, but it is central to all of those things. And I think it's something we can and should position ourselves to take advantage of and ride. Now, get, getting attention about riding waves means aligning with what families and cultures and schools are doing, and I'll say more about both of those, or particularly families and cultures in a minute. It also means claiming our spot on the wave. We're always very hesitant to claim our spot on the achievement improvement wave because it wasn't fundamentally what we were about. This is fundamentally about what we are about, I would argue, and claiming that uh, is part of what I think is both important and I would argue uh, later on a priority. We have to shaping, how we shape our approaches to the environments and the program design, how we change what we're doing subtly, in some cases and dramatically in other cases, is part of getting better at riding the waves. Improving our staff capacity is probably the most critical thing to do, and I'll talk more about that. And using data effectively is another part of learning to ride the waves. Now I want to shift from the promise to what I described as the problems or the opportunities and challenges. Getting intentional creates both opportunities and challenges. There's opportunities, I think, in the arena that we're talking about to use social emotional to talk about recognizing cultural differences, about dealing with disparities, about connecting the school and the out-of-school time world. And I'll talk particularly about some of what I think are the cultural aspects of this. But there are also multiple challenges. There are multiple frameworks out there. It's messy. There's a lot of different uh, social the capacities of the adults are a, a major issue. Uh, the sharing of the responsibility for who does this. Is it the family's role? Is it the school's role? Whose role is it? and the meaningful measurement of these things. I want to start fundamentally, and, and, and I can't emphasize enough, that all social-emotional learning is culturally and contextually based. The ways, your ways of being are partly based on where you've been, the cultures and the context you are. Your ways of being in this room are different than your ways of being in a rec center. So you have to remember that's true. You're not teaching a universal set of ways of being that you use the same everywhere. Part of what you do is teach the ability to read the situation and use the appropriate ways of being. So it influences all of our ways of being, how we learn them, when and where, and which ones we use with whom. But it also influences the relative importance of different ways of being. The best example I can think of here is the critical importance of positive cultural identity for those whose culture has been attacked, discriminated against, enslaved, persecuted. That's very different in its importance than it is to me as a white European male. My belief in my positive Swedish and Scottish heritage is not critical to my ways of being. It's foundational in some ways, but if I Come from, if I'm a young African-American male and I see how my culture is treated and how others treat my culture, developing a positive sense of who I am as an African-American male is important to who I become in a fundamentally different way than my Swedish heritage. And we've got to begin to understand that. Thirdly, culture and context creates additional dimensions that we have to navigate. And we can't ignore that it creates different conditions. For example, it creates differences about uh, of how we navigate when we're, the, the, when we're with those who are within our culture and our identity group. How you operate when you're in your comfort zone with the people who know you and where you can be yourself are different than 
the ways you are when you have to be out in another world, particularly if that world is hostile in some way. For example, in B, when the dominant culture controls the setting and you're not of the dominant culture, you've got to navigate differently and you've got to recognize that and you've got to figure it out. And that makes an additional burden on you as a person who's trying to develop ways of being. But it also puts a burden back on the settings to open up the possible ways of being so that the same way of being doesn't get punished in one instance and valued in another. Our disciplinary problems being a classic example of that disproportionate disciplinary issues. And then lastly, that when we are in, we've got to also figure out how to navigate our ways in a diverse multicultural setting. That is the nature of our country today. And we've got to learn how to deal with each other, whether we are white or black or immigrant or gay or whatever the variety of dimensions. We've got to learn how to live, navigate and develop ways of being around those things. So getting intentional around social emotional learning can complement discussions of climate and culture and society. It can enable ways of addressing discrimination in policies and practice. It can enable teaching about different ways of being respectful and usefully uh, interact. It can enable discussing the kind of commonalities and uniquenesses of each of our ways of being and the differences as well as the commonalities in those things. Now I want to move to the challenge side and talk specifically about the challenge of multiple frameworks, something that our community has been doing a lot of work on and something that uh, I'm seeing things happening nationally around. The challenge is threefold, I think. It's about selecting a way to approach frameworks, because there are lots of them out there. Uh, I'm working on a committee that has just identified, uh, where the staff member has just written about 20 frameworks and has 12 more frameworks to write about. 32 frameworks that is way too much. You can't keep them in your head. I couldn't even name half of them. And I've been studying them, theoretically. But we also have to, uh, the challenge is also about using frameworks across multiple levels and units. If you pick a framework, that's fine, but what if somebody at another level picks another framework? How do you get those things together? And then using language consistently and moving from evidence to practice to impact. That's the one. It's about working the framework that makes the most difference. That's where we have to get most intentional. So options for dealing with frameworks are wide ranging. You can choose and work a particular framework. You can choose the Castle framework or this or that framework. You can kind of adapt an existing framework to fit your needs better. You can create a new framework if you want to. I wouldn't encourage it. <laughs> I don't want to study it. No. But you can adapt and think about making it more relevant to you. You can focus on specific competencies. You can say, let's work, not worry about how to be, let's pick on these things that we're going to work on. Susan Crown Exchange took six things. Let's understand how we're going to do these best. You can connect what you're doing with all the different frameworks. You can try to figure out how do you align and connect and be able to use multiple lengths. Become multilingual about frameworks. What's the right one for you depends on where you are and what you're doing. Frameworks operate at these multiple levels from the policy and the community normative level to the organization system level on down. And you gotta think about what level are you talking about adapting it for. The Wallace Foundation and Ed Research has done a nice series of studies and there's a whole set of slides you can get. This is just one of a hundred and some slides I think they have. Um, and what they did is they looked at what frameworks and they asked for these different frameworks or different ways of talking about social media. How frequently are they used? How clear are they? in people's minds, what's the acceptance of them, and what's the sources of them. And the blue line shows social emotional learning is high frequently, is being used more and more. It's got mixed clarity, partly because of all these frameworks. Um, it's not yet clear about its acceptance. This was now, I think, two years ago they were doing this. Uh, but it's coming from many sources. And what you ideally want is something that's highly used, really clear, widely accepted, and widely sourced. Many people are talking about. You notice youth development is one of the ones that is low on frequency, positive though on clarity, medium on acceptance, and relatively few people are talking about it. So part of the wave of moving to social emotional learning is not to abandon youth development, but to take advantage of these new characteristics that it has and it moves forward. It's also coming up in a variety of policy levels. I'm not going to go through each of these, but Federal, state, 
local policies are all getting involved in one way or in talking about social emotional learning, sometimes in very specific ways, like in health education or in the academic plan, sometimes more broadly in the Every Child Succeeds Act. This is the one that talks about working the framework. This is work that Stephanie Jones at Harvard is doing, and she's talking about the fact that words matter. If you're going to talk about self-control is what you're focusing on, then you've got to get the evidence around self-control so you know what it is and why it's important. But you also have to think about how you're going to define it in your work, how you're going to make it meaningful to you. And then you've got to figure out the, the strategies you're going to use to move it in what your program is. And then you've got to study to see if you're, in fact, moving it. It's that cycle, familiar to many of us, that cycle of working it and working it with consistency around the language that's most important. So as I reflect on frameworks, no single comprehensive framework is going to emerge, folks. It's going to get more complicated before it gets more clear. Uh, CASEL is the closest because it's comprehensive and it's widely used. And if you're connecting to schools, you better know it because it's being used more and more in schools. Um, that doesn't mean you should do everything in the CASEL framework, but it does mean it, awareness of it is important. Selecting a framework should be influenced by the reality of how and where it will be used the most. If you're talking about a framework inside your program, then get something that fits your program well. And don't worry about all the other things. If you're in an environment that has somebody else selecting a framework, you're going to be working with the Minneapolis Public Schools, then pay attention to the frameworks they're using. And they're trying to figure that out. As important as selecting a framework is, uh, connecting with the frameworks already in use is also important. You've got to sort of recognize that. And how you use a framework to prioritize, develop, select measures, shape practice, how you work the framework, again, is the most important point. Progress around frameworks is challenging, but it's happening. Uh, Stephanie Jones, as I mentioned, there's reviews and comparisons of different things. We're now in the process of writing up several things in, uh, at uh, CASEL around this. And there is now a National Commission on Social, Ac Emotional, and Academic Development that's going to be doing more and more in this area. The, Second challenge we want to talk about is building the adult capacity, building the people and their social emotional skills who interact with kids. This is probably the biggest challenge, I would argue, and the most important to tackle. Challenge is threefold. There's a wide range of different adult competencies um, and, different, and very little preparation for teaching it. It's not something we teach teachers very well. It's something youth workers understand better and are learn better. But youth workers are in a wide variety of full, part-time, and volunteer roles, and so it's wide-ranging. The lack of resources needed to systematically enhance adult competencies is a real challenge. And the fear of adding something more on top of what people have to do when they're with young people is real, but also a challenge that has to be overcome, I would argue. And pushing a narrow set of competencies and fear of a narrow set of competencies is something I think we want to avoid but I don't think we want to fear. What I'm sensing in part in the field is that we are using fear of the worst to drive what we do to get to the best. And I don't think that's a good strategy. I'd rather strive for the doing it the best way and put up some prevention about doing the, watching it not get off track than try to watch and worry about, we don't try it because it might go off track and then end up not doing what we need to be doing. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. This is again from the uh, Wallace stuff. About half of the systems say they're in the process of doing something like this. They're trying to catch up with the wave, if you will. Uh, but four out of five say the adults uh, need a lot more training in this area. So that is the big challenge. We're making progress around this capacity challenge. There's growing recognition of this need. Uh, it's coming up in professional associations and a variety of things. The Center for Youth Development, and particularly Kate and their team's new toolkit and trainings are a particularly great example of how this is moving forward uh, here in the state. Uh, other places are also developing things that are useful. The Susan Crown Exchange Challenge that we heard about in a previous symposium and their Preparing Youth to Thrive guide is a wonderful, deep, rich dive into how you do these kinds of things. And the new... Uh, Propel SEL emphasis that we'll hear a little bit more on the panel is also doing work in this area and emphasizing how do we help the adults learn. Because remember, social emotional learning is mostly caught. And who is it caught from? The peers and the adults in young kids' lives. And those peers and those adults are in our program. 
just one example of practice. This is, uh, came out of a, a presentation uh, from the Collaborative Mentoring Webinar Series, and it's about uh, the Experience Corps uh, that AARP runs, a volunteer program for adults to mentor young kids younger kids. And they decided they wanted to get intentional about social emotional learning and they found that people were worried. It was a, one more thing on top of how am I supposed to, I'm a volunteer, what am I supposed to know about social emotional learning? And it was, uh, so they created a toolkit and they used it and here's what they found. Uh, the, the height of the uh, first two bars are how, how, uh, how many barriers people said they saw. Before they used the toolkit they were worried about the barriers. Yes, there's lots of things that I'm worried about. It's too much, I can't add it on. Uh, it's not tangible, things like that. After they used the toolkit, the tall bar shifted from the yes column to the no column. That's not barrier. When we get intentional, we get clearer. We get, it's ambiguity about what this is that is a barrier, not practicing it. If you can get intentional about how you practice it, if you can know what it looks like, it's like quality. You can think you have it until you understand what it is. And then you can say, gee, I could get more of that. Well, the same is true in social emotional learning. The challenge of, of responsibility is sharing responsibility. This is, again, a threefold challenge. Recognizing and engaging families and cultural groups is very important. One of the major things out of the Wallace stuff is if you don't include families upfront, and often, you don't get them on your side and they are as likely to become a barrier to doing work in this area as they are to be a support. Recognizing and building on competencies versus remediating uh, deficits. This is not about how do we help those most in need and most lacking these skills. It's how do we develop these skills in all young people. Help all young people have effective ways of coping, of ways of being. Uh, and the challenge of getting really narrow and pathologizing or weaponizing social emotion. What do I mean pathologizing? I mean, oh, let's defer that to the school counselors and let them intervene when there's a need to help someone on their social emotional skills. We need to do that, but that's not building it for everyone. That's recognizing there's a need for extra help, just like there is in math or in other areas. It's about supplementing, not instead of. It's not, you cannot develop, we cannot develop social emotional learning by referring it to somebody else because it's caught in our programs. You can refer if there's a mental health issue, you can refer in other instances, but you can't fundamentally refer out the responsibility for building social emotional learning. And we can't weaponize it, we can't make tests that say you gotta pass this, you gotta have this, you gotta do it this way. That's weaponizing it, say do it this way or else. That's not social emotional learning because those ways of being aren't successful. If you know the parenting literature, authorita authoritarian parents are saying, this is what you're gonna do. And what kids learn is whoever's in charge, that's what I do, I do what they tell me to do. That's not gonna help young people in their development. Progress around responsibilities where, where uh, being uh, social emotionally equipped is a language that's now in the Generation Next stuff, and we'll hear a little more about that from Michelle. Uh, it's, there's stronger recognition of the role schools in play, and so the uh, MDE, and this, we'll talk about some of the new uh, social emotional competencies. Uh, Minneapolis is now building it into their public schools, are building it into their strategic plans, and there's a growing understanding, as I said, of the family perspective. Here's an interesting set of do's and don'ts with families. Uh, do when you're talking with families, stress the complementarity to ac academics rather than the more greater importance of it. Frame it in the big picture as helping students succeed and stuff. Acknowledge all the roles that have to be played in this, not just your role or their role. Uh, start with familiar skills and build up the case for other kinds of ways of being. You don't want to leave parents out, as I said. You don't want to stress the emotional over the social and the academic because it sets them back in a different way. You don't want to fast forward quickly to assessment and data and things like that. You don't want to lead with inequity. Interesting. Why? Because when you lead with inequity, they think you're saying we failed. And you don't overlook the how-tos and the practical applications of it. Lots more on that to be learned. The challenge of meaningful measures is also uh, one of the challenges we talk about. Uh, 
challenges fourfold with selecting an appropriate measure, avoiding use of self, uh, social emotional learning measures in a high stakes way. If there's one thing you take out of here about measurement and social emotional learning is don't use it in a high stakes way. If the measures aren't up to it, our systems aren't up to it, and it's punishing for the very things we want to be rewarding. Growing the utility of measures for informing practice. We've got measures that came out of research. How do you get them that are useful to practice? And growing practitioners' ability to use data. Progress around measurement is happening in a lot of different ways. There's guides around from AIR and Center and others are developing more guides. There's a new repository being developed so you can go and find measures and how they're being used. Um, there's new announcements of student survey I'll say in a minute. And there's the piloting that's been doing, and, and there's training going on today about social emotional learning and the holistic student assessment that's being used around the region. This is an example of one use of data. This is the three ways in which uh, Generation Next talks about wanting Minneapolis and St. Paul youth equipped to learn, social and emotionally equipped to learn. That is having a positive identity having social competence and having and learning. This is analysis by Michael Rodriguez of the Minnesota Student Service, so this is statewide data. And what you see is only 13% of the of, uh, kids in the state who did the survey have none of these skills. 42% have all three of the skills, but there's a lot of them who have but one or two. We can start, by looking at data in this way, we can start seeing what we need to work on. This is useful data in terms of helping us think about what we can do to change these. How do we improve these things? And these things matter. Michael's analysis showed kids with none of these skills had an average grade point of just over a C. And those who had all three of the skills had a grade pattern average of over a B plus. More than a grade level difference. So these skills do matter for academics, but they matter in themselves as well. There's also dis disparities in in uh, these kinds of skills. We should know that. But notice the disparities have a different characteristics than when you look at the typical academic disparities. Uh, the highest group here is Somali youth on commitment to learning. Somali youth in the state have a higher commitment to learning than white youth. Asian youth have a higher, Hmong youth have a higher commitment to learning. The, and when he, Michael looks at the differences, the discrepancies in social emotional learning are smaller than the discrepancies in achievement. One way I interpret that is it's our inability to deal with the differences rather than the differences themselves that are affecting learning. That is to say, it's not how well, just how well the kid is his commitment to learning, but it's how our institutions work with that kid to nurture that commitment to learning or punish that approach to their way of being. It's that interaction that matters. It is contextual and cultural, as I said earlier. The priorities I want to talk about uh, quickly here at the end are, uh, I think the priorities for getting intentional are five. First of all, I think we have to continue to build the wave, framing social emotional learning's importance for success. While it's becoming better understood, we have to continue to teach and educate our parents, our families, our legislators and others about the importance of these skills for success. They are as important a predictor or better predictor of success than anything we're doing in achievement. So these things matter. Secondly, and very importantly, we've got to boldly claim the role of out-of-school time in this area. We've got to claim our ability to do it. And we've got to claim the processes that work in doing it. That is, we've got to claim both the process of working on social emotional learning that's so central to what we do, but we also have to claim the outcomes that are valuable. We've got to be willing to talk about social emotional skills in the young people, whether we're influencing them. Not in a high stakes way, I want to stress again. Thirdly, and probably the biggest one again, is building the adults' readiness and the program's readiness and capacity to be intentional. We've got to help people figure out how to do this. We've got to work the frameworks we select. We've got to learn how to use data for improvement and not high stakes. I've said enough about that, I think. And we've got to focus on accountability 
We can't ignore accountability, but I would argue we've got to shift the focus for accountability from outcomes for kids to outcomes of whether we, as the adults in their lives, in the places we're designing, are we creating the conditions for young people to learn effective and a positive, healthy ways of being. Doing that means we've got to think about it from the family, the school, and the expanded learning, and we've got to think about it in both taught and caught ways. I'm not going to go into this because of time, but I would argue that schools have to improve the integration of the way they're working on trying all the things they're doing in it, but most importantly, they've got to think about improving their intentionality in the way social emotional learning is caught in their settings. The way we model it in schools. For the out of school time world, I think we've got to we'll do a great job on quality. We need to keep working on that quality, but we also have to get more intentional about the ways we teach it. Not in a sit down and lecture people about social emotional, but the way we design our things so that the learning is more intentional, more focused, more helpful to them in thinking about it. Getting language that means, uh, that brings meaning to what we're talking about and doing with young people. And for parents and families, we do have to work on awareness, but we also have to work on the supports. How do we help parents understand and, and utilize the supports of the same? 